Last week we began a journey of uh, one of my favorite books in all of the Word of God. And I told you that while I love all the words of God, I love every book in the Bible, and uh, they've all helped make me into the man that I am today. The one that has had the greatest impact on me in a day-to-day -day manner is the book of Proverbs. And uh, there's so much wisdom, there's so many great truths for all the different areas of our life that we looked at last week. And that's one of the reasons why I am so excited to be in this series with you uh, right now. For, for you to, to open yourself up to the wisdom that God has for you in your life at this particular time. And, and one of the things that I'm doing as I prepare to preach each week is I'm not just asking, God, what are you saying to me from the book of Proverbs? One of the things that I'm asking God is, God, what, what do you want to say to the people of God at Hessel Church? And what do, you, what do you have for me to say? And I'm going to share with you that as I was preparing and putting this series together, I, the word that came to me, and it wasn't an audible word, but it was as if the Holy Spirit just said the word hope. Hope. And thus I began to, to do some study and, and think about this whole concept of hope that we're going to lift from the Proverbs today. Because if ever there was a time that we needed hope, it's now. I mean, if, if we were just stop for a moment, in recent weeks we've had riots, even in our own capital. We, we've had an impeachment. We've had an inauguration. We have all this tension that everybody's got opinions on. And we're not even talking about COVID and the spike that we've had, had there. And so, to be very honest, there's an extra burden on my heart today as I preach to you to make sure that I'm really listening to the Lord to share with you the hope that you can find in Him. And that got me to thinking quite a, quite a bit. God, what do you have for me to say on this particular day. And so, I don't know where you've been living, but I need some hope. And I want to be honest with you, it's a difficult time for us to navigate our lives as Christians right now. But as a leader of the church, and a leader of, as a pastor in Sonoma County, I think there's an extra burden on me, and I need hope, and I hope that this message will minister to you as well. Because quite honestly, we can at times feel and even be overcome with a sense of hopelessness. What is going on? What's going on in our country? What's going on in our state and our county? If ever we needed it, we need hope. So this last week, I googled hopeless, hopeless. And I came across several articles, and I'm going to share four of them with you right now, that were actually written just recently about hopelessness. Uh, here's one. It's on the screen in front of you. 45% of Americans are feeling down, depressed, or hopeless during the COVID-19 pandemic. Here, here's another one from CNN. Feeling hopeless after a tough week? Here are five things that may help. That's a CNN article. Here's an HR online resource. Here's a headline. Burned out, hopeless, drained. Mental health concerns are prevalent during COVID-19. Fortune.com has an article that, that says this. A mental health crisis is unfolding in the workplace. COVID, politics, and racial injustice are to blame. Man, you just read through those headlines and you find out pretty quickly that we need hope. So the question is, what is hope? I had to go to the Webster Dictionary to get the best definition I could. I oftentimes go there when I'm trying to figure out what a word means. And hope is this, a desire with expectation of fulfillment. You got that? Let me read that again. A desire with expectation expectation of fulfillment, to expect with confidence. 
many people in our American culture think of hope as kind of like a wish. Like, I, I really wish that I win or I hope I will win the lottery. I hope I'll get a new car. I hope my, my, my little toddler will sleep through the night. I hope, and it's kind of just like a, a, a wish. But the word actually means a desire with an expectation of fulfillment, to expect with confidence. So let me put this up here for you as a Christian. Hope for the Christian is confident expectation based upon the character and promises of God. T today you and I may be facing situations in the world Turn on the news, look on social media, talk to your neighbor across the fence. It, it doesn't matter. We may be dealing with situations that seem hopeless. But here's what you and I must know. As a follower of Jesus, you and I can have hope. Hope is not a wish. Hope is not based upon circumstances. Hope is not based upon society, politics, or culture. Here it is. Hope is based upon the character and the promises of God. Hope is based upon who God is, his character, and what he has said, his promises. That's what our hope rests on. Let, let me give you an example of scripture, in scripture of this. Now, many of you know this passage of scripture. Maybe you've quoted it. Maybe you've memorized it, I should even say. And it's found in Jeremiah chapter 29. I'm going to put it on the screen in front of you right now. It says this, God is speaking. God says this, For I know the plans I have for you. Just leave those words up there. You see those? You know what this is telling us? It tells us that something about God. It speaks of His sovereignty, His omnipotence. He is in, in absolute control. I, I've said it before. He's large and He's in charge. Let's read it again. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a... Now listen, wherever you are watching online, say those, that next word with me. Here we go. A hope. To give you a future and a hope. What a beautiful word, hope. I know the plans I have for you, and these plans, God says, ought to fill you with hope. Now, some people say, well, Rich, that, that passage is written in the Old Testament times. It was, it's not for us. It's written for the nation of Israel way back when. Well, it's true. That is true. It was written in the Old Testament. It was written to the Jewish people, children of Israel. But there's many promises that were given to the children of Israel that are also applicable to you and me today. Now, one of the things you have to understand is that this message went to the children of Israel who were living as exiles. You know what exile means? And if you're in exile, it means that you're being forced to live in a place that is not your home. You're being forced to live in a place that is not your country. It's not your home your home. See, the nation of Israel at this time were, were for centuries living in, in Babylon. They, they were not in their home. They were exiles. And, and they were being forced to live in a place that wasn't home. And God says to them, I'm going to give you a promise that there's a future and it is filled with hope. Let me tell you how that applies to you and to me today. You and I, as followers of Jesus, are exiles. We are not living in our homeland. Many times for us as Christians, especially here living in America, if we're not careful... Our Christianity can be so woven in with our culture and our civic identity and even politics that we can forget that we are living in a land that is not our home. 
In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says this, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying? This world is not our home. Listen, listen carefully. One of the reasons why we as Christians are so frustrated one of the reasons why we are so angry, one of the reasons we are so confused and discouraged is that it is because the world that we long for, the world that we desperately desire is not the world that we live in. This is what happened. The moment that you and I became Christians, God came and lived inside of us. He changed us, he forgave us of our sins, and he came and he, and he lived inside of us. And in that moment, he, pl he birthed in us a, a longing for our home. And the problem is, this world is not it. It, it is a future home. He, he birthed in us a desire for another kingdom, another world. <laughs> and let me give you some good news. Matter of fact, it's such good news, I'm going to put it up on the screen in front of you right now. It's this, as believers, we can have hope that one day the world we long for will be the world that we live in. I'm going to say that again. See that? As believers, we can have hope that one day the world we long for will be the world that we live in. All of those righteous desires that you have and that I have for this world, hey, those are right desires but they're not going to be found in this world. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Rich, what in the world does this have to do with Proverbs? I thought we were in the book of Proverbs. Now, let me just tell you something. We're in the book of Proverbs. I want to read to you from Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. It says this, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. This is, this is that first part of the verse is really what I want to drill in on. I want to unpack for the rest of this morning. What does the word deferred mean? The, the word deferred actually means to drag or to pull or to prolong. It has the idea, the word deferred, that, that you're postponing. It has the idea, what the, the writer of, of, of Proverbs is saying, is that something that looks so good, it look, the, the hope that it looks like is right in front of you, and once you get there, it gets delayed. It gets postponed further off into the distance. And if this keeps on happening over and over again, it makes your heart sick. Do you know why so many of us are struggling right now? It's because, it's because we set our hope on things that are not certain. We think we're making progress to something politically. We're making progress at something. And we get there and we find out, hey, they just moved the goalpost again. It's further off. And we get frustrated with that. Here, let me put something on the screen in front of you. If your greatest hope rests in anything in this life, your life is always going to be sick and left unsatisfied if your greatest hope rests on anything in this life your life is going is always going to be sick and left unsatisfied let me remind you of something this world is not our home this current world will never satisfy our longing and if you set your hope, your confident expectation on the things of this world to satisfy your deepest longing, listen, church, you're never going to find it. You, you'll never be satisfied. You'll always be heartsick. You're always going to be frustrated and unsatisfied. Let me give you an example of this. If you put your hope in politicians... And in politics, you're going to have a sick heart. Because what's going to happen is they're going to make promises to you. And you're going to think you're going to get close enough. Oh, it's almost there. 
but it's going to be delayed. It's not going to come. It's not going to come into, into fruition. And you're going to have a heart that is sick. Now, some of you are thinking right now, oh man, Rich is talking about Republicans right now. And some of you are thinking, no, no, Rich is talking about those Democrats over there and others, and libertarians or independents or whatever other group. No, no, I'm just telling you this way. Listen, no political platform, I don't care where you land, is without weaknesses. All of them have weaknesses. And that's why we as Christians speak the truth. But we yearn and desire a world that is to come because this world church will never ever satisfy if you put your faith and your hope rather in country you know i'll tell you this some people read their bibles and they think that this is all they think about think of america as the promised land can i tell you something america is never mentioned United States of America is never mentioned in Scripture. Never mentioned. But if you put your hope in America, I, I listen, I want America to be the best country it could possibly be, but if my hope is in America, I, I'm, Scripture tells us, wisdom tells us that we're going to always be dissatisfied. We're always going to be heart sick. If you put your hope in economics, opportunities of this country you're going to always be heart sick you're always going to be disappointed and unsatisfied but but if you put your hope in the world to come if you put your world your hope in the kingdom to come uh, listen we get glimpses of it right now but let me tell you something world will be sweet for a season of time it'll be great but if you put your hope in the world to come you're going to be dissatisfied you're going to be heart sick we must rest our hope must rest in the world to come now let me tell you something when i read the book of proverbs i hope that you're starting to do that as you read it you need to personalize what it's saying so I, I'll look down in my Bible and I'm reading something that is, is talking about um, words of correction. And, I, and, and many times in my Bible, I'll just write right next to that and I'll say, you know, the wise man, the wise person is not offended by correction because that's personified. I, sometimes I, I'll read along and I'll read and I'll say, wisdom trains up children in the way they should go. I personalize it. I'm always trying to see from the book of Proverbs what wisdom sees, what wisdom does, how wisdom responds, what wisdom pursues, what wisdom understands, what wisdom describes. And as it applies to hope, let me put it back up here on the screen for you, hope deferred makes the heart sick. So what does that teach us about wisdom? Well, here it is. Wisdom hopes for that which is sure. Here's what I'm telling you. If you put your wisdom in the things of this world, let me tell you, wisdom defers is going to make your heart sick. I'm telling you, the world to come is sure. Now you say, Rich, what in the world? I thought we were talking about of hope and Proverbs and what, what, where are we going with this? Okay, I, what I want us to do for the remaining part of this message right now is I want to pivot and I want to unpack four things about the world to come that is sure, that you can find confidence and peace and hope in. And so I want to do that. I'm going to do that. I, I put it together as an acrostic. And so you can kind of, we're going to spell out the word hope. It's intentionally spelled out. And we're going to take the first, the first uh, phrase, the first lesson we're going to, or point we're going to learn is this. Hurts will all be healed. Listen, we're, we're living in a time where there's lots of hurts. Many people are feeling hurt justifiably. Because of injustice, because of betrayal, because of economics. I mean, I've talked to business people whose businesses have been hindered and even shut down because of the pandemic 
and they're hurt, and justifiably so. Um, what you need right now is hope. When you're feeling as if you've been hurt and the world around you is hurting you, let me encourage you to read the end of the book. Go to the last two chapters of the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, and read about the future hope you can have. Uh, John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is able to see the world that is to come. And in Revelation 21, John writes this. Verse 1 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away. <laughs> That's a good place for us just to stop and shout, Amen, huh? I mean, I'm so thankful that the world that we live in now is going to pass away. It's going to be no more. God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Look at what he says. Let me go on. Verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Man, that alone ought to encourage us and inspire us. God will physically be with us. Now I want you to focus in on verse 4. Here it is. He, that's God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Some of you are crying tears that you think nobody sees, that you think nobody hears, that nobody notices. Here's what I'm telling you. That your father sees those tears, he hears your cry, and he is noticing. You have his attention. And in the new world, he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. Look what he says next. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. The great pastor and preacher, Tony Evans, while talking about verse 4 of Revelation 21, he says this, All the things that make life difficult will be wiped away in heaven. <laughs> that ought to give you hope. The stuff that you and I are facing right now, regardless what it is, regardless what place you're in of despair and hopelessness, let me tell you something, all the pain and the sorrow is going to be wiped away in the world to come. The Bible tells us all the way back in Genesis that God created this, this world and it was perfect. And he created everything in it, the, the stars, the, the mountains, the trees, and, he, and the crowning achievement of his creation. He created mankind for us to be in relationship with him, to us to, to love him and to know him. And that's what he created us for. And we read very early on in Genesis that sin came into the world. We abandoned that relationship. We said we don't want a God telling us what to do. We as mankind, Adam and Eve said we're breaking. And that relationship broke a relation, our, our relationship with God, but it did something else. It broke the world. A curse came as a result of sin. And that curse brought brokenness in this world. And every generation and every country and every people group, all of us have experienced the, the brokenness of life. Matter of fact, in, in Romans chapter 8, uh, the Apostle Paul writes 
through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says this, that the whole creation groans because it's been broken, waiting for the day when Jesus is going to return and he's going to make this creation, put it back together, make a new world for us to, to live in and to enjoy. I, I want to put that verse back up there, verse 4 back up there on the, on the screen for you. And, you. and we read this. Verse 4 says, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, Neither shall there be any mourning. Just look at that word mourning for a second. That's grief or suffering. That's what that word means. Then he says, nor crying. Actually, that word means shouting out in grief. Nor pain anymore. That, that means it's a labor that demands the whole strength of a human being. Look at me. Some of you this morning are mourning with grief some of you this morning are, are are crying out shouting out laboring just to make it through another week you, you understand this and here's the promise listen that's in this world but focus your your hope on the world that is to come he will wipe every tear from their eye He's going to remove every sorrow from this world. How does that happen? How is he going to do that? Oh, Galatians 3 tells us. And you know, Paul actually wrote this, and many of us don't understand this, but, but take a look real quick. Galatians 3, 13 says this, Christ redeemed us. Oh, that's good. From what? From the curse of the law. What's that? It's the penalty of the, and the consequences of our sin. It's the brokenness that came as a result of our, our sin against God. He says, he redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. What's that mean? It means this, on the cross, Jesus took all the penalty of our sin, all the curse upon himself. He endured the wrath of God that we deserved. He took it upon himself. He died in our place and later, three days later, rose from the dead as a testimony of the fact that God had accepted his sacrifice on our behalf so that now you and I can place our faith in Jesus. And we, church, listen, we can look forward to the day that we will be with him in the new world that he has created for us, where everything will be restored, everything will be redeemed. That's what we place our hope on. So the first thing, hope. Hurts will all be healed. Secondly, oppression will be over. Will be over. <sighs> oppression is something that we live with. It's not new to us who live in the United States. Oppression has been a part of the humanity of mankind since its beginning. It's a result of the brokenness of our world. And, and so many times we ask the question, well, what is oppression? Oppression is wielding control from the outside. It, it usually manifests itself by the evil mistreatment of others. And, and oppression is a sinful way to, to treat other people. It really, oppression is say, says something like this. I'm better than you. I am, I'm better than you, and I am going to look down on you with my speech and my actions. Now, I want to break this up, and there's two kinds of, of oppressions that I want us to just talk about briefly. The first kind of oppression is a physical oppression. Uh, we, we've seen this in the last two or three years, and uh, we, we've seen societal movements start. We saw the Me Too movement as a result of oppression. It was to talk about a sexual abuse that was happening to, to men and women. Uh, and many of you may have not heard about it, but another movement was birthed. It was called the Church Two Movement that was talking about sexual abuse that had taken place in the evangelical churches that, uh, that, that we have around us. More recently, there's another movement called Black Lives Matter Movement. And all of them have been birthed out of oppression out of abuse 
Now, let me say a couple of things about oppression as it relates to Christians. And here it is. Oppression, we, we as Christians must stand against oppression in any form. Whether it's spousal abuse, child abuse, sexual abuse, bigotry, racism, classism, social injustice. As followers of Jesus, listen to me, whether regardless of how, where we see oppression, we must speak out and become an advocate for the oppressed. Now, you say, Rich, why would you say this? It, it sounds like you're becoming rather political. No, I'm not. What I'm becoming is I'm becoming biblical. There are two reasons why Christians must take a stand against any kind of oppression. And here, here's the first one. The first one is this. Jesus demonstrates care and compassion for the least of these in society. Over and over again, you cannot read uh, the accounts of Jesus' life, you cannot read scripture and look at his life without seeing that over and over again, he, in his public ministry, we see this over and over again, he always looked out for and showed care and compassion for the least of these, whether that was the leper whether that was the outcast woman, whether that was the despised Samaritan or an unwanted child. He always showed compassion and care for these. Listen, as Jesus' followers, we're called to follow his example. We must do the same. We must speak out against all who are marginalized. This is not political. See, here's the deal. We're thinking that all of this has to do with is a political dialogue. Listen, we need to stop talking about it in a political realm and start living it out as, as, as Christ followers, as kingdom people, caring for people, loving them as Jesus would. Proverbs 31 verses 8 and 9, we read it last week. Let me go back there. Wisdom says this, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. We thought that was just a political word. No, it's not. Long before the Republican Party and the Democratic Party and any other parties out there could come up with anything. The Bible's speaking about justice. The first reason, Jesus modeled for us care and compassion. We must do the same. Here's the second one. The New Testament teaches us that there is complete oneness in the body of Christ. Now, Paul talks about this in the book of Galatians. And, and again, we could gloss over it. But man, this was the most radical statement that could have been made given the cultural background of, of Paul's day as he's writing to the church at Galatia. This is a radical statement. Here it is. He says it in, in Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male or and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See what that means? Is the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. And for this reason, there is no place in Christianity for a spirit of superiority that manifests its way in any way that is oppressive to other people. Every form of racism, bigotry, supremacy by one group of people or culture over another group of people or culture is sin. And I'm going to add this right now because I think the church needs to lead by example here. And, and, and so I believe that it is time for the church. And, and please understand me. I, I, I'm not, this is not political. This is biblical. I believe that it is time for the church to move from being not racist. Because we all say, well, I'm not racist. To being actively anti-racism. 
as we seek to bring, do we love everybody? We value all people. Oh, does the world need an example of what this looks like? They need to see it in the church. As we wrap our arms, and come alongside, uh, uh, wrap our arms around and come alongside of people of different color, different nationalities, different languages, and we love like Christ loves. And so there's this, there's this physical oppression. Here's the second kind. There's a, there's a spiritual oppression. And I just, again, we have a spiritual enemy who wants to wield his control in this world in cruel and unjust ways. He wants to get us to, to look at different people differently. In light of all the oppression that we see going on, let me just tell you something again. This world, is, it's always going to have oppression in it. And there's times that we see the races and different groups coming together and, and enjoying good relationships. But we're, you get glimpses of it. But one day, it's going to be there for all of us. we got to speak out against it now, but we, our eye is, we're looking on the world that is to come. And you're saying, Rich, I thought we were talking about hope this morning. Where's the hope in this? Listen, here it is. Revelation 21, verse 25 says this. In the daytime, and I love this parenthetical expression, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. Now, one of the things you got to understand is in Scripture, darkness always refers to, or oftentimes refers to, evil and crime and wickedness. And in John's day, to be locked outside the city gates may, meant that you were in a dangerous, dangerous place if you were there after dark. You and I live in a day where, there, where Satan is wielding power and control and getting us us to be to, to, to be in conflict with different groups of people different political parties he's at work and we need to stand up against it we need to say no i don't care if you're on a different political party i don't care if you see the world different hey let's not forget about the world that we're going to i i am tired of seeing the effects of our oppressive spiritual enemy in the lives of so many people I have seen people get divided, listen, within their families over difference of opinions politically. They won't even talk to each other. I've seen people divided in their family over different views of COVID. Different views. And we're just, oh, and now we got something. Listen, we have a spiritual enemy. Do not fall prey. Remind yourself, there's no differences. We're all on level ground before the cross. We all need each other. We all need to love each other. And one day, we're all going to stand around the throne. Brothers and sisters, people from the Democratic Party, from the Republican Party, from the Libertarian Party, and the Independents, and people who th think we should handle COVID one way and another way. Our enemy is working. And we need to stand up against that. Hey, greater is the is the relationship, our bond in Christ, than any of our different views about these other things. I'm tired of seeing the effects of our enemy in the lives of, of, of people, whether that be addictions, oftentimes a divorce, abuse, terrorism, uh, suffocating fear and anxiety that many of us, but here's what John says, listen, in the new world, there's going to be no darkness. It's all going to be removed. We're going to be in the presence of Jesus. John MacArthur says this, there will be no rival to the glory or authority of God. The cosmic conflict of the ages will finally, will be finally ended forever. And God and his people will dwell in utter security. Amen. Let me tell you this. We are headed to that world where the oppression is going to be over. Until then, man, we stand up, we speak against oppression oppression but that's where we're going hurts will all be ended oppression will be over here's our third one i'm just going to talk about the next two quickly peace will be present you probably figured this out already i don't need to tell you this but in the world right now we don't have a lot of peace do we we have hatred we have war we have riots we have bloodshed we have death we have conflict these are the things that fill our headlines. 
but in the world to come, there's going to be peace. One of the things that you and I must do is think more about that world to come and less about all the problems of this world. It's been my history for my, my pattern of life. When I'm going to an appointment, I'll get in my car. Many times I turn on the radio and I'll listen to the news. Can I tell you something? In the last several weeks, I'm not turning it on because it just stirs me up inside. And instead, I've chosen to listen to some music, worship music. I love to hear some, just some instrumentals that I know the, the words of the songs to, hymns, and it just puts me in a better place. But what? That's thinking about the world to come. That's thinking about Christ. Here's what the prophet Isaiah said. He was prophetically talking at one particular point about the world to come. And this is what the prophet Isaiah said. He said this. In the future world, in that day, the, the wolf and the lamb will live together. See that? In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. You may be a city folk and you may not know this, but probably you do. Wolves and lambs don't hang out together. But in that day, in the world that is to come, let me tell you something. Wolves and lambs are going to get along. And they're going to be hanging out together. He, he says this. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. And the leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with, with the lion. And get this, a little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. Listen, church, peace will be present. Your hope rests not in this world, not in circumstances. It rests in the world that is to come. Hurts will all be healed. Oppression will be over. Peace will be present. And fourthly, eternity will be every day. What I've just described for you is not something that we're going to have for just a couple of hours or even a couple days. But weeks and months and years for eternity. We're, we're not going to have it just for one political cycle, but for eternity. And that, that's why John, in the last book of the Bible, that last chapter of the Bible, in, in Revelation 22, he writes this, and they will reign forever and ever. I want to put up that last slide where we spell out the word hope. As Christians, we can have hope. Hurts will all be healed. Oppression will be over. Peace will be present. Eternity will be every day. So here's where I leave you. That's where we started. As Christians, we can have hope that one day the world we long for will be the world that we will live in. Focus your attention there. If you put your hope, if you put your hope, if I put my hope in the things of this world, man, hope deferred brings a sick heart. You're going to be sick. God would say, hey, put your hope in the world that is to come, in that which is sure, that which is certain. Here's the, here's the story of this entire book. God 
loves you. God has saved you. If you're a Christian, he is, you need to understand, man, he, your relationship with the living God is right because you have believed that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose. You've committed your life to him. Listen, all is well. He's going to walk with you ever, through every challenge and every day. Listen, keep your eyes on him. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. No, the, the hope that we have, we place our hope on that which is sure our relationship with Jesus, and that which is eternal. Some of you might be here today and say, Rich, I don't, I don't have that certainty of where I would be. If something were to happen to me, if I were to die, I'm not sure about that world to come. You can be sure. This book says that God loves you so much that though you have sinned, He did something about it. In John chapter 3, verse 16, it says that God so loved the world, so loved you, that he gave his only son, that's Jesus, that whoever believes in Jesus, believes in him, should not perish because of their sin, but have everlasting life. And it's my encouragement for you today to simply place your faith in Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? If that's you, while your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, if that's you, just, just you can pray this prayer with me. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, today I believe. I believe that you're God. And you came and died on the cross to pay for my sin. So I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And help me to, to live for you. I need your help. Thank you for being raised from the dead and proving that you're God. But from this day forward, I want to live for you. Give me the hope that can only be found in you, that which is sure, that which is certain. The Bible says if you just prayed that prayer, you became part of the family of God just right now. And Father, we want to pray for the wisdom, for your wisdom as we live out these, our lives during these crazy times. Lord, it's unthinkable. that in, in one week, we could go from an impeachment to an inauguration, to riots, disagreements, and Lord, COVID cases that are spiking in different places and people dying and getting sick and other people getting sick and recovering and just there's so much chaos and we're sheltering and we're not able to see family some of us and we got all this stuff lord i pray that your hope would that encouragement that confident expectation for that which is certain would be our focus lord may we see when we're starting to get frustrated and angry and and, and um, hopeless god May we realize that our, our focus, our hope is in the wrong thing. Our hope needs to be on you, that which is certain, sure. And God, we pray that you'd remind us of that. May the church rise up and may we show the, the, the rest of the world what it looks like to live confident and hopeful lives, not for one political cycle, till the next guys win or the next guy loses. But rise up to say, this is what it looks like. We, we live in hope for that which is certain. That one day, all our hurts will be forever healed. Oppression will be over. Peace will be enjoyed by all. And we'll get to enjoy it, not just for a day, but for eternity. Lord, I want to pray for this, your church today. And Lord, I want to pray that you would give them great encouragement. Lord, if they need to turn some, some noise off that they're listening to online or on the news, Lord, give them wisdom to do that. And Lord, if their, their hope is deferred and they've got a sick heart this morning, Lord, may their hope be that on that which is certain, which is on you, who you are, and the promises that you've made to us, your character and your promises. 
And Lord Jesus, may you bless this, your church family today. Huh, Lord, I thank you for your word that is so encouraging for me and for us as a church family. May we live different lives this week because our hope is on that which is sure and certain. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for watching Hessel Online. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay up to date on the latest content and also share it with a friend. And if you've been blessed by our ministry and want to support us financially, you can give through our app or, or click on the link in the description below. I want to thank you again for watching and God bless you.